Okay, so today we're going to explore chapter 15, uh, Purushottama Yoga. <clears throat> this is the ultimate Purusha. So in the Bhavata Gita, there are a series of attainments. There is the attainment of the self in chapter 6, where one becomes the context for the content of your ego, your life. There's the attainment of the absolute, which is a deepening of the attainment of the self. <clears throat> this is in chapter 8. Both of these are still individual attainment. Then we have the ecstasies and the final attainment in chapter 12, which is with God, with the manifesting Shakti principle of the creation. And this chapter is the last attainment. This points to a state of consciousness that is beyond what the Gita has been able to describe fully before. So it's pointing to something that's perhaps the most mystic, the most abstract of principles. So I will see how far I can get in clarifying what this is. So far, after chapter, after chapter 12, when one attains the state of God. You're living in a universal state. The world opens itself to you. It shows you all its secrets. It starts revealing the nature of the three gunas, the way the energy flows, the way Shakti works, how transmission works. Anyone who's attained the 12th chapter is a certified spiritual being on the planet. They may or may not teach, but if they do, they're the powerful teachers in the world. And their greatest <clears throat> expression is divine love, mm -hmm. oneness, the transmission of love and oneness. This is the ultimate expression of Shakti, of the creation, is Ananda, of the principles of Sat, Chit, and Ananda. Sat being absolute truth, which allows for existence, Chit, consciousness, and Ananda, the experiencing both horrific and incredible. Knowing, the knowing and the experiencing is all Ananda. So the one who has come to the state of God is the Ananda. They're the radiating principle of the Ananda into the creation. Of course, there's still Sat and Chit, Sat, existence, consciousness, and bliss, but what they communicate is the bliss. It's a radiant principle. One is, there may still be a personality, even an apparent ego, but there really isn't anything at the core of them. However, they're still acting out <coughs> samskaras to some extent, in terms of their ability to function in the world. They're still doing things that are coming from the impulses of still being in the body. <coughs> now, however, we're coming to a different type of attainment. In my experience, it is where the individual and the universal finish, complete. It describes the nature of the condition of this reality at the most fundamental level. This state becomes available to one when they have succeeded in transcending the three gunas. The three gunas, the three energy waves of Sava, Rajas, and Tamas, are the manifesting principle of creation. When one has gone beyond the three gunas, which is pointed to at the end of chapter 14, then the next possible state, which may or may not happen, is this one where they become a resident in that state of consciousness that's beyond the three gunas. Okay, so we'll begin reading chapter 15, Purushottama Yoga. Chapter 15, Purushottama Yoga, the Yoga of the Supreme Being. The Blessed Lord said, this eternal tree is said to be imperishable, with its roots above and branches below, whose leaves are the hems of the Vedas. 
one who knows the truth of this tree is a true knower. Nurtured by the three gunas, the branches of this tree spread both below and above. Sense objects are its foliage, the roots which, which also spread in both directions bind the being with actions in this world of matter. So these two verses are allegorical. They're pointing to this idea of an upside down tree. There are so many parts of the human system that have the same sort of branching to treachery kind of uh, visualization. It actually is a good way to understand that the source of this creation came from above. So what is this tree? This tree is speaking of the nature of this existence, what we call Prakriti. Prakriti is the creation from its most highest expression to the very top of Sattva, the creation exists. There is no creation, there is something other than creation beyond that. So from above, the, the root, the branch, the trunk of the tree is the intention of the original sought to come into existence. That is the manifesting principle of all this existence. It is the source of all that nourishes and sustains this existence. Once it comes into existence, it starts branching out, creating tributaries, manifesting in in infinite ways. With the leaves are all the experiences and the knowings possible in all dimensions of all creations, not just the one we know. And again, it's like a banyan tree. If you've ever seen a banyan tree, it, it comes up from the root, the branches go out, and then they thin down and they start rooting. So it creates roots, not only more roots up above, but down below. So it's, this whole creation is sustained in multiple ways. So complex, so interwoven, that it is not possible to know it. It is impossible to grasp it. But as above, so below, <clears throat> each of our bodies carry the same principle. There is a root of our existence that comes out of matter the very foundation of our physical body, the very foundation of the organization of our body. And then there's a root above that brings us this intelligence, that brings us this self-awareness, this knowingness. Of course, initially it was that, but once that which is the sought descended into creation, it involved itself in creation, it lost itself in creation, and created what I call the dark sot, or the inconscient truth that is embedded in matter. These two polarities that are the source of this existence, above and below, they both they exist outside of existence. So that which is above and that which is below are expressions of the same thing, but that which is below loses itself, involves, until it's completely lost in some very, very primitive, unconscious condition. And in that most crude, primitive, unconscious condition, it then strives to wake up. It strives to come out of it, its involvement by evolving. And in this process, all of the physical life has come into existence, and ultimately, all of us have come into existence. So there are two forces that have made us up, one from below and one from above. The one from below is the essential quality of what's true, real, in matter. And it's this reality that's involved in matter and evolving that makes this world seem so real. Because it's drawing from the same reality from above. That's why any attainment that goes only above this is half of the truth of existence. Okay. Yeah. 
It is not possible to know correctly the nature of this tree in this world, neither its beginning nor its end, nor also the secret of its true existence. Therefore, one should cut this firmly rooted, ever-changing, imperishable tree with the axe of strong dispassion. Thereafter, that goal is to be sought from where no one ever returns, taking shelter in that primal spirit from whom has come the flow of this creation, one should meditate on him. So the mind is not adequate. Even when the mind shuts up, there the knowingness that comes when the mind is silent is not sufficient to understand it. It is a weave, a web of of unimaginable epic proportions of which it's impossible to operate within and not be entangled. You couldn't have existence without it and with existence comes entanglement. It's inevitable. As long as you're in a body or in a subtle body of any form, you're entangled. Be it this body or your subtle body or your causal body, it's still bodies, you're still entangled. So this entanglement is everywhere, and it's speaking of a state that can be reached through intentionality that is beyond all entanglement on every level. Okay, so this chapter always enchanted me. It had a resonance in me but I had no idea what it was until 2004 and the samadhis began. For me, my samadhis were downward. There are samadhis that are upward and there are samadhis that are horizontal. You have waking samadhis, transcendent samadhis, and what we call static samadhis. So my first samadhis were all static. I would disappear into the bowels of my existence. And there was nothing there, but it was nothing that the mind could know. But it was absolutely, totally captivating beyond any bliss, any goddess to see, anything I had experienced in the creation. This last three and a half years, and after three and a half years, it started to quiet. When that quieting happened, after some time, I came to what I consider the final state. I became, the, I became the truth, though I didn't know that's what it was. I became the absolute, I didn't know that what, what it was. But it wasn't the same samadhi as the one when I would go deep. And in my life, this has been with me since 2007. These samadhis did not fully stop. They were just not as ferocious. So after about three years or four years, they began to quiet down and I came to this poise where it was very clear to me that I was a person and I was the universe at the same time. I didn't know that I was also that in which both of those arise. That hadn't come fully. So I was, but I was living in a place where there was nothing to lose, no fear, no doubt, there was, I could dive into any part of human life and be untouched. I could immerse into any kind of activity and not be overtaken by it. It just wouldn't stick. It would be felt, experienced, and then it would go away. It's like Teflon. It would just, things would touch me, I would feel them, and then they would go away. The personal part of me still could experience, the personal part of me could still know, but it wouldn't last. Nothing would last. But there was no loss. I was full, complete, whole. This still isn't the Purushottama, because it didn't include the ultimate transcendent, the transcendent Samadhi. I did not know the transcendent Samadhi. That actually has become shown to me in these last two years. So this is a new revelation relative to my experience. It only occurs when I'm meditating with a group and the group can't be just with me. 
So when I started doing the conference calls, something started happening. I didn't understand what it was. But last night, it became completely apparent. It always shows up just in time for the Gita. It became realized. It became real. And I said, oh, this is the transcendent sat. So in the transcendent sat, it's also nothing else exists but the sat. But because I already have known the dark sat, the involved sat, I was able to stay awake for it. It's an awakening of it. It's a staying awake for a state of consciousness that in ascension, that normally I was not able to hang on to. I would wink out. The, this body, this consciousness couldn't hold it. Not that it didn't occur, but there was nothing here to register it. There was nothing here that could make it real. So though this experience has been coming, the one last night just went click. It just became solid. And I said, oh, now I see what this is. And this is what this verse is talking, this chapter is talking about. The fully awake, beyond the guna, transcendent samadhi. It's like you're in the source of the Gangji. You're at the source and it's pouring out with tremendous force from its source over from which is a grand river that goes, flows through all of northern India. And you're in the source, and you're not swept away, you're not lost. You're present with the source. So this is, from my experience, the best description that I can speak of. And there is no, there is nothing to be done in that. It was, it's very clear, it's just coming through. There's no, it's just I'm holding it. I'm experiencing it. I'm the plumbing for it. So this is the experience of the Purusha Uttama. And it is saying in this chapter that this is a yoga. This is a spiritual practice. This has a means for manifesting this quality of Satchitananda, because that's the force that comes into existence, is Satchitananda, giving it breath and freedom to flow, to branch out, to create this river that nourishes the lands. So you become the tree. You become the trunk. And what does the trunk do? It nourishes the branches. And what do the branches do? They nourish the next set of branches. And what do they do? They nourish the leaves and the fruits, and such is this manifestation. But where this comes from never changes. It does not evolve. It does not change. It is eternally now. It's always been in the now. It is timeless. It's only when it enters into the creation that any time is involved. And as you come out of that timelessness motion and you descend into existence, then time starts happening. But for you, what would be one minute is a half an hour on the, on the lower plane. The closer you are to the sot, you are in the timelessness. But as soon as you begin to descend, you enter back into time progressively. So one of the measures of tending how deep you go or how high you ascend is how fast time seems to go by when you come back. If time flew by, then that means you've ascended or been descended quite profoundly, quite deeply. then there is the place where that becomes established. And then you're always in timelessness, even though time is going on at the same time. And that's the paradox of this thing. From this goal, one never returns. There's nothing more. This is it. <clears throat> 
and there's other qualities about this which I, I need to clarify. This idea of what Purusha and Prakriti. We talked about Purusha and Prakriti in the 13th chapter. Purusha being the impersonal Shiva or the Sat or the truth and Prakriti being everything else, the manifesting existence. So up to now, there, this has been the duality. There has been a Purusha that is associated with the person. There is a Purusha that is the governing Purusha of which all our little Purushas are expressions of. And the Purushottama is a Purusha that's even greater than that. So another word for Purusha is being. So a being is different than Sat. Sat is not a being. Sat is a principle. Tat is not a being. It's a principle. These principles are somewhat, and this is their essential way, different. So a being lives. Being, a being can be. A being means the capacity to be part of the becoming. If you're not a being, you're not part of the becoming. The fact that you can know something beyond the becoming is an impossibility that I it could never imagine could happen. So we're, we're at the extreme end of what's possible on the spiritual path. We're as far as you can get and still have a conversation of any meaning. So this is the being that's right there next to the Sat. It is as much beingness that the Sat can ever have. It's the absolute and its first moment of expression into the creation, into the becoming. This is the Purushottama. This is the Ashwara, the God of Gods. It is the ultimate Purusha. So, another languaging, it's the Atman. The Atman, and then you have the Jivatman. And then you have a para-atman beyond the atman. So if the atman means soul, we have a soul that's associated with our person, the personality of the body, the jivatman. Then you have an atman from which that soul for the jiva drew from. And then you have an atman that's beyond that. So these are all three different words pointing to the same principle. It's very hard, it sometimes gets very confusing until you understand that. But the soul and the being and the purusha are the same terms, effectively. You can say the, there is the purusha has not been contaminated by being a jiva. Just like you say an atman can, has not been contaminated by being a jiva atman. The true Atman never has had that exposure, it never had existence as an individual, it didn't have self-awareness. The self-awareness is a gift from above. The root above has given us this self-awareness, this intelligence, and this will. And the, and the trunk below has given us this physicality, this body, this incredibly sophisticated, complex vehicle by which consciousness could reside and wake up. Okay. Move on. Those who are free from arrogance and delusion, the evils of companionship, desire, the problem of duality, of happiness and sorrow, and are ever established in contemplation on the Supreme Self, are able to reach that imperishable goal. So, not very many get this. <laughs> it, it means a complete immersion. Usually this means someone who's in samadhi. It means samadhi states have come. One of the three samadhis. The descending samadhi, the awake samadhi, or the transcendent samadhi. That's the only way it can happen. And it's not like you're thinking, obviously. It's a complete absorption. It's like being in a fire. So you don't have to think about being in a fire. You just cook. Right? So thinking of the supreme being is to be the supreme being, not knowing yet that you're the supreme being. 
So <clears throat> when the, the consciousness has shed a great deal of its entanglement with this tree, then basically by staying in the fire, all this entanglement gets dissolved. Now I did pass over one very important verse, one part of, uh, of the first three verses, the third verse, 553. Therefore one should cut this firmly rooted, ever-changing, imperishable tree with the axe of strong dispassion. What is this saying? It's saying that you, the individual jiva, to whom this is happening, has a role to play. And that is to not believe any of it ever. To not get sucked into any of it ever. Now it says with the acts of strong dispassion, but what does this basically mean? It means a, a stable recognition of what's real and what's not real. What's true and what's not true. You cannot be overtaken by the, the Prakriti. I mean, you will be overtaken, but in moments. Maybe it's even hours. Then it becomes moments. Then it becomes just passing. It doesn't, until this final samadhi has occurred, the root of your individuality has not been cut. The root of your individuality will continue when you drop your body. The root of this individuality will continue and maybe you will take another birth even if you've attained God oneness. Even if in previous life you, you know the I am this. Even if you lived in the self. In those lower, lesser attainments you will definitely come back. You'll want to come back. You'll be interested in coming back. When you come to the attainment of God then you come back in service. You come back to serve the world. But when you come to the attainment of truth, there's nothing to come back to. You are that. There's no coming and going. There's no longer the individual that can be in time. You become that source. Now, a lot of people, this understanding happens in the, in the sixth chapter when you attain the self and you become the context. It's there. And when you wake up as the Brahman in the 8th chapter, this same recognition is, is there. That, that this world is other than what you are. And when you're with the oneness, the world is who you are. The world is what you are. All of it is you. This is of a complete different order. There is, it is then that which is and that which is not is all you. And then there's nothing. There is just that. Now, experientially, the qualitative difference between knowing this in the sixth or the eighth chapter or experiencing this in, the, in relationship to existence in the twelfth chapter is of a different, it's a whole different order, a complete quantum different kind of thing. In that case, for you, your branch is cut. And that is the imperishable goal. Neither the sun nor the moon nor even the fire can illuminate that attaining to which no one ever returns. That is my supreme abode. So there it is. So this is the final absolute attainment. We've been describing the journey from dejection through all these different stages. This is the final possible attainment that each and every human being carries that pot potentiality. It will happen. It will inevitably happen that all that you called you will be burned in the fire of the truth of what you are. How long it will take varies. But once you are on the path, it is like a moth. All you want to do is burn. 
You just want to burn and that lets you know where you're headed. A portion of myself has become the eternal soul in this world and draws to itself the mind and the five senses, which rest in Prakriti. When the Lord acquires a body, and also when he departs it, he goes taking them along like the wind blowing perfumes from their source. Presiding over the senses of hearing, sight, touch, taste, and smell, and also the mind, this embodied being enjoys the object of senses. The deluded do not know how the soul departs or dwells in the body, or how it enjoys the object of senses, but one who is endowed with the eye of wisdom is able to know this. So these verses are now showing you what this means. As I talked about the jivatman, it's the soul. It, takes, it is the animating principle. It's the seed of your existence. It is the purusha of you. It's the jivatman. It is that core part of your sense of I amness derives from this fragment of this absolute truth. It's the one that has experienced your life. It's the one that has the sorrow and the joys and the pleasure. It's the one that gets deluded. It's the one that comes out of delusion. It's the one that takes birth. It is with you individually. It's an individual expression of this universal, infinite principle. It is this principle that aggregates, that takes on qualities. It becomes entangled, it becomes involved, it becomes involved with having a body, it becomes involved with what it hears, what it feels, what it tastes, what it touches. It becomes involved in its capacity for action, it becomes involved in discovering its ability to master the vehicle it's occupying. It becomes involved in its ability to figure things out, to think things, to understand things, to conceive of things. All of that comes from this tiny little fragment, this tiny little fragment of this vast infinity that we actually are. So when we die, when we drop this body, this, these gatherings, these impressions, these experiences follow with us into the subtle world. And even though we no longer have eyes, ears, nose, mouths, the impressions of those are still with, with us. And to varying extent, they still remain with us as we leave the body and as we ascend. And the more we ascend, the less and less they are strong. So when we're, get, when we're just coming out of the body, things are very tangible, almost as if you're in, you're in a body. People who travel, astral travel, this is their experience. When people are able to go further and actually come out of their body and, and transcend into the early psychic, outside of the psychic field, then you'll meet living beings that exist within a subtle body that has a derivative of the body we have, eyes, ears, nose, mouth, or the ability to sense. And as you ascend, you meet these great beings with magnificent bodies, with luminosities and and great uh, apparel and appearances and radiant presence, they still have something of their original nature reflected. And after you descend higher, even those fade away. And all it is is this radiant light and force and presence until even those disappear. So as long as the consciousness is swimming in this ocean of entanglement, there will be these attributes, these qualities for experiencing and knowing. So these qualities is the ocean that Sat swims in for its own enjoyment, for its own play. And we are an expression of that, play. And it can, of course, can't be play if you're vested in it. You ever notice it with, with uh, uh, monkeys in India? When they're, the monkeys in India are young, they play with each other. But when they get older, they fight with each other. So <laughs> if you're fighting, you're more vested. If you're playing, you're less vested. You're having a good time. So the problem with human existence is we're taking it all too personally. We're taking it all too seriously because we don't know who we are yet. We don't have the big picture. We don't have the long view. 
then it is play, no matter what it shows up. And this is very handy as we start getting into the next chapter where we talk about the dark forces. So you have to be at a pretty high place to see the dark forces and see it as play. <laughs> so this is describing something of the nature of who you are, so it's letting you know that what you are can never die. The essential part, quality of your I amness is eternal. It may not focus on anything once it's in the absolute, but it is there. It cannot be lost. Nor can it, it can be added to, but it's always temporary. You can add more information, you can add more experience, but after a while what you really are is not dependent on what you add or what's taken away. Striving yogis are able to see him seated in the self, but those who are not self-controlled are not able to see this in spite of their best efforts. The brilliance of the sun which illuminates the entire world and the luster that shines in the moon and the fire are from me. Entering the earth with my cosmic energy, I support all beings and I nourish all the plants by becoming the nectarine moon. Taking the form of fire in the body of all creatures, I join with the prana and the apana, and I digest the four kinds of food. I am seated in the hearts of all beings. From me come memory and knowledge and forgetting. I am the object of knowledge of the Vedas. Alone I am the author of Vandanta and the knower of the Vedas. So this is an introduction to what you really are. This is an introduction to the reality of what you truly are when you come out of this imperishable tree. It's revealing to you that in your essence you're not this one little fragment, you're the whole, as well as this little fragment. So let's take, let's, this is a cosmology. It's a revelation of a cosmology in these verses. It is first starting the brilliance of the sun, so the source of the Ganges, the trunk of the tree, of the imperishable tree, the source of existence is the sun, but it's, in, it's impossible to tolerate. The sun consumes everything if you come too close to it, but the luster of the sun, the reflection of the sun, that can be experienced. So all of this existence Literally, physically, we drive our existence from the sun, or suns like it. The semblance of matter, the ability for life, the cycles of existence. If there was not the sun, we would perish very quickly. So the sun is, in this way, a perfect analogy for understanding the nature of the sat, of the truth, of the reality of what we are. And from that comes this cosmic energy. Now the translation of this word is not adequate, but we can say this intending force of the original in, uh, of the original intent. This intent to be, intent to exist, intent to come into knowingness and experiencing. That force, that cosmic force, is the Satchitananda before it became Satchitananda. It's that prior to the Satchitananda where the three qualities of existence, consciousness, and bliss are one. It is like white light to the primary colors. It has the source force comes into existence, and that is the manifesting force, in, is the luster, the ray, the wave frequency of the transmission of that original reality that sustains all of us and all of existence. I support all being and I nourish all the plants by becoming the nectarine moon, taking the form of fire in the body. This fire is what lives us. It is, in a normal human being, a tiny little trickle. It's a, 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 like a, like a, uh, one of those sterno flame. It's just a little flame, you know, barely has any force, but the human being lives his whole life with that little flame. When the Kundalini awakens, it becomes a fire. 
When the Kundalini awakens, then you can experience the current of the chit, the consciousness. Awakening within your body and a flame comes. This they call this in Sanskrit, Agni. Everything associated with the sun is Agni, fire. This awakens from the sot below, embedded in the essential quality of our matter. It is the branching, it is from which the trunk from which all branches occur. If you look at the body, it's the heart. All the arterial all arteries come from the heart. So the center of the sot embedded in matter has its reflection in the body in the center of the heart. And this sat is the apana when we breathe. It's the embedded sat that's hidden, involved, forgotten. And it lives in the first chakra. But it expresses itself through the force. So it lives in the first chakra. When the prana, which comes from above, is breathed in, it calls to the sat that's embedded in matter, it calls to the apana that lies within matter and says, come back, come back to me, come back to yourself. And it awakens the prana. This is the kundalini. It awakens the kundalini within the body so that it can merge with its other aspect, with its prana. It becomes alive, it becomes living. It animates, and then you have an awakened being. And the entire process that's described in the Gita only occurs because of these two principles. And this awakening process is always energy, fire, satchitananda. It can be sat, chit, or truth consciousness, or it can be consciousness bliss, or shakti. It can express in either of those two forms. There's a force of consciousness that's expressed as truth into this existence, which cuts everything that's untruth. And there's a force of thought that expressed into this existence that produces bliss, oneness, connection, fullness, experience. Both are two principles of the same thing. Each person tends to one or the other in varying degrees. Satchitananda is the birthright of all of us. It is what we are. It is the truth of what we are. We are this current. As consciousness, we're the living principle. We are the current of Satchitananda. We're not this body. We're not our experiences. We're not the thoughts. We're not the impressions. We're not being a teacher. We're not being a mother. We're not being any of these things. It, these things are not relevant to fire. Fire burns everything but what it is. It all becomes fire until the fire is complete and then it returns to its original nature. So this is the cosmology. Taking the form of fire in the body of all creatures, I join with the prana and the apana and I digest the four kinds of food. I'm seated in the hearts of all beings. For me come memory and knowledge and forgetting everything you know about yourself. I am the object of knowledge I am of the Vedas. Alone I'm the author of Vedanta. I am the knower of the Vedas. You have been seeking yourself all your lives. You've always been this. This idea of separation has just been an illusion. You are the fire. That's why when people come to me, I ask, well, what do you experience? Do you have an experience? So when I know that someone's in awareness, the fire hasn't started, then I know that the true transformation hasn't started. If someone is in awareness and they start processing pain and suffering and separation and bondage and misery, then I say, okay, that's the beginning of the fire. The log is wet, but it's beginning to burn what's not burned. And in that process, it becomes a flame. And then all the negativity burns out and it becomes just the flame. Then I say, hey, progress, transformation. I smile. Why are you smiling at my misery, people tell me. Because I'm watching the flame. I'm watching the progress. There is progress. 
I'm always happy to see progress. In this earthly plane, I manifest myself as two Purushas, the perishable and the imperishable. All living entities are perishable, but the unchanging soul is called the imperishable. The Supreme Being is other than these two, who as the Supreme Self is the immutable, all-pervading Lord and upholds and maintains the three worlds. Since I am beyond the perishable, and higher than the imperishable, I am known in this world and in the Vedas as the Supreme Being. So in the Gita, the soul in us in the body, the Jivatman, is a person. And the person is perishable. The person, personality, the personality and the individual collection of experiences that are unique to you do perish. The body may perish first before the impressions perish, but they're not, they're temporary. But the living principle, the soul, never perishes, but it never evolves. It doesn't need to evolve. The soul has no need to change. It's the vehicle in which the soul resides. When the consciousness as a person comes out, it begins to recover its original nature in the context of having been a person. Then we get all the information, then we get all the experiences, then we get all the religious religions and the realized beings. If it wasn't for the content, the vehicle, if it wasn't for the dark sot, nothing would be known, nothing would be able to be experienced, there would be no memory. There would be no way of tracking what happened the last moment to what's happening now to what's happening the next moment. There would be no linearity. There would be no record. There would be no language. There would be no evolution. There would be no nothing to know. It would just be happening, 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 like it is for a newborn baby. Just happening, 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 with no record. So the soul is eternal. It cannot evolve. This lives within each of us. This is what the spiritual path is pointing us to. Then there is the universal state of the Atman, the vast divinity awareness, or the fullness of the Shakti, the God realization. This is not perishable. The state of consciousness that one comes to in God realization or truth realization cannot be destroyed. It's not the full expression yet, but it cannot be destroyed. It includes every, it's no longer individual, so therefore it no longer, but as long as there's existence, it exists. The only thing that happens in the Hindus, they talk about it, a day is a thousand yugas, and a night is a thousand yugas of Brahman. So what happens is, in this state, it's still in reference to the creation. It's still in reference to the imperishable tree. So you sleep along with the rest of creation. And you wake up along with the rest of the creation. But in the state of the Purushottama, there is no sleeping, there is no there is no waking. It's always there. Always on. It is that in which these thousand yugas, the days and nights of Brahman arise. So I've just stretched this about as far, I know, as any of you can follow. But that's what this chapter is doing. This is the extraordinary thing of the Gita. It's talking to something that actually can be experienced. It's talking about something that you can't even imagine, that actually when it starts happening, you say, now I get this chapter. Even when you thought you get the chapter, you probably get it more and more. Wh whoever put this together, what an extraordinary thing, this Bhavad Gita. After being freed from delusion, 
When one knows me as the supreme being, he worships me in all respects with his whole being. Arjuna, this most secret doctrine is revealed by me. Realizing it in essence, one becomes wise and perfectly fulfills his duties in life. Thus ends the 15th chapter of Gita entitled the Yoga of the Supreme Being. Okay, so that's it. That's it. Of all the attainments, that's the final. You reached as you stretched as far as you could. You could follow me as far as you could go, and that's what it's pointing to. You'll forget all this, I assure you, as soon as we walk out of the room or if you quit listening, watching this video, because it's not yet able to sink in. But it does give you a sense of further no matter where you are. The wonderful thing about the Gita, I read it continuously because it keeps reminding me of what's left. To the nooks and crannies, the things that haven't yet been clarified, the ambiguities. So it can be an Indian companion until this body has finally given up its ghost. <clears throat> I'll probably just be finished. And what is finished? I'm unfinished. But what is finished would be, nothing of this individuality would be left. The root's been cut. And at times, this can be quite disturbing. Because <laughs> you, you're a ghost. You know, you have no existence. But somehow, you start talking, you start interacting with people, you start moving, and you come back into existence. But I am sure that when this body's finished, there won't be anything to be in existence with anymore. It won't stay. I can't imagine. But then I could be wrong. To know something in the reach of your experience or in your intelligence or in your spiritual attainment is still not a guarantee that it's full and complete. There's still more. If anything this journey has taught me so far, there's still more. Okay, so with that, we conclude the chapter of Purushottama Yoga. So if you know it or not, the Purushottama is doing yoga too, through you, through each of us, through all of us. So it ain't over yet, no matter what you would wish or hope for. That's just another part of the imperishable tree. I'm there. This is it. Okay. So with that, love and blessings to you all. May truth manifest.